Matthew chapter uh, 14. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our setting. Father, we want to turn our, our hearts and thoughts to, to you and to your word and to uh, Matthew sharing with us, Lord, this idea of the, the king that's come and present his credentials, the king that came and authenticated who he was and, and then was rejected uh, by, the, by the leaders of the nation. Lord, and as we continue in a, in a journey, in a sense, and now watch him train his disciples, Lord, we pray that we'd be trained as well. What he's teaching them, the experiences that they are having, Lord, help us to uh, learn from these. Uh, I think of uh, Paul's uh, words in Romans 15, 4, uh, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through in endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Lord, I pray that we'd be encouraged, we'd have endurance, Lord, because our, our hope is set in you. Bless our time now. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in a, a new section again. Chapter 1, 2, 3 is, again, that presentation of the king, his genealogy, uh, and then his uh, authenticating uh, through fulfilled prophecy uh, who he was, and then through chapters 4 to 12, we saw him uh, doing the miracles and uh, the things that only the Messiah could do, and again, fulfilling prophecy. And then it was uh, in chapter 12 uh, that we had the national rejection uh, of the Messiah as that generation of Jewish leaderships committed the unpardonable sin, again, which is not an individual sin, it was a national sin committed by that particular uh, generation. And because of that, we hit chapter 13 and everything changes at, at that point. Jesus hasn't begun to talk to them about the cross yet, uh, but that's going to be coming soon. Uh, he be does begin to teach in parables, so the crowds are, in a sense, not understanding, but he is teaching his disciples and explaining those parables. And we've spent two weeks going through the kingdom uh, parables of chapter 13. Chapter 14 now uh, is another shift. Chapter 14 uh, to chapter 20. Some have called it the retirement of the king. Not that he's uh, kicked back on the Mediterranean or anything, but he'll, we'll see here and we'll see why there will begin to be a withdrawal from the area that he's normally been teaching in around the Sea of Galilee, around Capernaum. He's going to still be in that area, but we're going to see here, uh, uh, he now comes on the radar of Herod who has the uh, jurisdiction in this area. And uh, we'll see that uh, uh, he, Herod thinks that Jesus is possibly John the Baptist come back to life because he's killed John. Uh, at this point in time, uh, his life, in a sense, is threatened by Herod and his jurisdiction. Uh, and so he will go to the other side of the lake. He'll go further north. He'll go up to Caesarea Philippi. You'll see him now in and out of this area, in a sense, staying away from uh, 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 Capernaum. And, and in particular, he would never enter the Siri, city of Tiberias where uh, Herod would rule and reign. Nor would any rabbinical teacher, because because of Herod being there, they considered the town cursed, because that was one of his palaces and where he, he lived there. So there, there's a move away and a concentration on, on teaching these 12 guys uh, his principles, uh, discipling them. And I think that's where, again, it's all been beneficial up to this point. But we, as best we can, we want to begin to, as his disciples, draw out the teaching of Jesus in terms of how he would have us, we saw last week, expand the kingdom, uh, as well as how he'd have us live our lives. There's some great principles here uh, for us. Uh, this includes the, uh, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels except the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, of course. John 6, 14 definitely calls it a sign or, or a miracle. It's one of the seven signs that he gives uh, in his Gospel. 
and uh, and we'll see the the circumstances that uh, that lead to that miracle. Let's take a look first at uh, what I'm calling the conflicted king, who is Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas. Verse one. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said uh, to his attendants, "This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him." Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guest, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Several things that are uh, conflicted here with, uh, with Herod. He was conflicted, certainly, about the reports of Jesus. And, and again, this is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great reigns from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C., not uh, Jewish by, uh, by birth. He's a, a descendant of Esau. He's an Edomite. Uh, this is one of his sons that survives. Uh, Herod the, the, the Great was, uh, was a tremendous builder uh, in Israel, uh, certainly, but... Um, that doesn't speak of his character. I've got one definition in your notes from Unger's Bible Dictionary that says he was a heathen in practice and a monster in character. Uh, it's been said that it was safer to be Herod's pig than his son uh, because anybody that he saw any threat to him at all, he would uh, immediately uh, execute. He had nine wives, some say ten, and thought nothing of, of killing his wives if it didn't fit into his plan. This is the Herod that killed all the infants in Bethlehem. Herod the Tetrarch means that uh, his, at his death, his kingdom's divided up in four portions, and his son, Herod Antipas, is the guy in our, our story here. Anti means against, pas means uh, against all. So he's a guy that has a name that says he's, he's against all. His mother is Herod the Great's, I know it sounds like a soap opera, and it, it gets, I won't even go to all the details, but just a, is a little detail is uh, sometimes helpful. His mother is Herod the Great's fourth wife, and she's a Samaritan. So here, Herod the Tetrarch, his father is Herod the Great, his mother is a Samaritan. Do you think he was well liked by the Jews? <laughs> they hated his guts. Uh, add this to a little bit of, uh, of the background. At one point in time, but and it's important to note, he was very interested and in tried to keep up with his learning of Judaism because he was ruling over them, as well as what we sometimes call Jewish folklore. And we make reference to some, some, some things that, um, that we hear or that we're aware of in studying the Bible that fall into that category of Jews, Jewish folklore. And, there, and there's quite a bit of it. And, uh, and, and some of that plays into why he's afraid of Jesus. Uh, but for example, again, of his character, he had a, a, a dispute in the Torah of the, you know, the law of Moses with the Sanhedrin. They kind of argued it out. And of course, the Sanhedrin are the scholars of the nation and they won. So he had them all executed. He killed every member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, so again, so this is the Herod uh, that we're talking about. And our, our point is, here's a guy that uh, uh, is very much conflicted. Now, the, the folklore part is important because back in Deuteronomy 18, Moses said that another prophet, one like me, the prophet, will come. Now, uh, we look at that and the prophet that would come like that, uh, we believe that would be the Messiah that he was talking about. Uh, but again, according to Jewish folklore, if it's going to be another one like him, they said maybe it's going to be Moses raised from the dead. Maybe at some point in time, Moses will come back to earth once again as the prophet, and then we'll know we're really in the end times. So the idea of John the Baptist comes, and he's, he's a tremendous prophet. He's the first prophet in 400 years. 
not just a few people. I mean, the, the whole nation was pretty much flocking out to hear him and so forth. Tremendous popularity. And of course, he, uh, uh, when Herod Antipas uh, takes a trip to Rome, he ends up meeting his brother, or at least half-brother Philip's wife, Herodias. He seduces her and then brings her back with him uh, to uh, this area of, uh, of northern Israel in order to try to legitimize this. He divorces uh, his, his wife at that time, gets her to get a divorce, and then, and then marries her. And John is, is uh, constantly saying to him that you're committing adultery. You're not fooling uh, anybody by, by doing this. And, of course, it's Herodias then that can't stand it and request that he be arrested. And so he's, he's placed in, uh, in jail. Uh, but again, here's a guy with, uh, he's really uh, concerned because he's killed John. And, uh, and now Jesus is there doing all these miracles. This other rabbinical teacher that he really doesn't know that much about other than he pops on the scene on his radar and appears to be a messianic-like figure. So he's thinking in his guilty conscience you know, if you're following the reason, if Moses is, could be the prophet that could come back from the dead, and John the Baptist is a great prophet, no doubt. That's why he doesn't kill him. All the people recognize that. He possibly could have come back from the dead. You follow that? So it's not, it's not I mean, he's kind of a crazy guy, but that's, that's kind of the thinking there uh, because of the, the passage in Deuteronomy 18 and, and the Jewish folklore he would be familiar with. So he's conflicted because he thought that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. Secondly, he's conflicted because he had arrested uh, John. And, and, uh, and certainly we had a mention of, of, uh, of John the Baptist earlier. We talked about the fact that he's being held uh, down near the Dead Sea. Down near the Dead Sea, on one side is, is Masada. On the east side, on the other side of the Dead Sea, uh, is a palace that Herod the Great built that now belongs to Herod Antipas. That's where this scene takes place. Archaeologists have uh, under, uncovered it, gone through its, uh, its several floors. Uh, it's set on a plateau that is higher than, than Jerusalem. So from up there, you had quite, quite the view. Uh, in the basement of that is where the dungeon and the prison was where John's being held. Uh, and again, the archaeologists have found that, found the chains and the whole thing where John and others would have been held during, uh, during this, uh, this time period. But um, so he's arrested John. He's put him in prison in this place called uh, Macarius, this fortress. Uh, and, uh, and he's down there apparently for a party at this time. Uh, again, look at verse 4. It says, uh, for John had been seen. In other words, when John accuses him of adultery, it's not like a one-time thing. John is on the streets and around the guy constantly saying it constantly preaching, this is wrong, this is adultery, uh, you know, and uh, God's going to judge you uh, for it. Not too many prophets around, <laughs> around these, uh, these days, but uh, John let them have it. John refused to compromise when it came to the Word of God. Let me get, read a reference to you from uh, Mark chapter 6, a little more information. There it says, for Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison, Macarius, where we've talked about. He did this again because of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying, a continuous action to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him knowing him to be a, a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. This guy's really conflicted. I mean, he's like, Jesus is over there, and maybe that's John the Baptist. He's got the guy arrested. In one sense, he's only doing this because of his wife. He, he kind of wants to do something about it, but he can't. She wants him dead. He doesn't want to. He visit, he's visiting him, apparently, down in the dungeon and, and talking with him. He's kind of puzzled by it all, but he likes it, you know. And at the same time, uh, the third conflict is, in the end, he does want to kill him, but he can't. Uh, his wife is pressuring him. 
He wants to kill him. He feels like he, you know, uh, that would bring peace in the family. But he can't because the people see him as a holy and a righteous man. So he doesn't. So this is a guy with tremendous conflict in his life. Uh, the next conflict is he's conflicted because of an oath that he made. And that, again, is because of the scene that is described, uh, fortunately, briefly here for us, which was a plot by Herodias and the daughter, which, uh, again, tells you a little bit about uh, their character. She puts the daughter up to the next time there's a big feast, uh, which basically would have been a drunken orgy. That's what history tells us. Uh, and then they're all drunk. I want you to go in and dance. And again, in the language here is an indication this dance was very sensual. Uh, and it says Herod was well pleased uh, at, uh, at that. And uh, to really make things complicated, this daughter is his niece also. And now he's, quote, stepdaughter. I mean, this whole thing sounds like a soap opera. Uh, and then he says this crazy oath. Uh, probably was something like, oh, half, up to half of my kingdom. Give you anything you want. So he promises her anything that uh, he wants, uh, she wants. Now she says, on cue, based on what the mom says, this is not your typical request. You know, I want some diamonds, some jewelry, whatever. She says, I want the head of John the Baptist brought on a platter right here, right now. He's stuck because he's got his dinner guests are, are uh, the legal representatives and, uh, and so forth of his kingdom. It's other officials he cannot lie or go back on his oath in front of them. He doesn't want to do this, but he's, he pretty much has to do it. Again, John is downstairs in the dungeon. That, that's why this, this all happens in, in Macarius. And he gives the order and <clears throat> John's head is, is brought. And uh, his disciples come, bury his body and, and deliver the, uh, the word to Jesus in terms of what's taken place. Uh, there's one other conflict that's here that takes place later that's not in our text. And uh, that is he was conflicted because God was silent to him. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the rest of the story is um, later on during the, tr the trials, plural, the trials of Jesus uh, there before his crucifixion, before Caiaphas, before Annas, uh, the two trials before Pilate, and between the two trials for Pilate, he finds out that, you know, Herod's trying to, excuse me, Pilate's trying to get out of convicting uh, Jesus and finding him guilty, finds out that Herod's in town. Jesus is from Galilee. He's the king over that area, so he sends him to Herod. Herod's been wanting to see him, hear from him, and he wants him to do a miracle for him. He's very, excite very excited about that. But in reality, Jesus refused to speak to him. He won't even say a word to him. And um, we could say, here's a guy that was able to silence the voice of God, which is a, a pretty sobering thought. He also goes down in history with the dubious honor of being the man who killed the greatest prophet to ever proclaim the word of God, John, John the Baptist. So this is a guy with a tremendous conflict uh, in his life. And, uh, and that sets the stage now for what's going to happen and why Jesus begins to geographically move his ministry to really uh, some different areas. And uh, I've got some water right here. It's just us, right? Oh, the guy with the camera's going, don't move. Yeah, okay. They're very good at editing. So as long as they're editing, they might as well edit out me drinking the water too, right? So again, one conflicted king, and Matthew needs to insert that so that we understand what's going on now with the ministry of Jesus, and also to contrast that king with the king who's incredibly compassionate. And we'll see that in the feeding of 5,000. Verses 13 and 14. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And uh, the, we want to note first, certainly they had a compassion for John the Baptist. This was his cousin and, you know, they, they may or may not have, you know, known each other as kids growing up. They certainly knew about each other. They both had miraculous, you know, prophetic things uh, about their births and, uh, and, uh, and so forth.
And, um, and of course, it's Jesus that goes to be baptized by John. Jesus was very much aware of the ministry of John the Baptist, that that was his forerunner and so forth. And, and, um, uh, and so certainly he had compassion getting this news. Now, the, the news was, was twofold. It was not only that John had died, because chronologically, again, in our text, it goes back in time, so that had already happened. But now with that is the news that not only has he killed John, but now he thinks you're John. So that means he's probably going to kill you as well. Uh, but he has uh, tremendous compassion, and he'll withdraw. Uh, and the reason that he'll withdraw is because he did not come to die at the edict of Herod the Tetrarch. He came to die at the edict of God the Father, and he would do it exactly on time, and it would be in Jerusalem. It would not be somewhere in Capernaum or, or somewhere else. Jesus is not moving away in a sense so that he won't be killed. It's why he came to die, where he came to die, and the exact date that he would he would die on, and so he begins to uh, move away. Now, it says he goes to uh, NIV. I think it says uh, a solitary place, a private place. And uh, and just to mention something very uh, briefly about that, some other uh, modern translations will say a deserted place. And the reason that they do that is because the original King James translators back in the 1500s came across a word uh, as describing where he went and said it was a desert place. Well, by the, there's no desert place on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, so they, they change it to deserted, it becomes solitary. Only until recently did we really find out more about that particular Greek word and its usages, and then find a, 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 a parallel uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, and now we know that that, land, that word means pasture land. <laughs> and there's is there pasture lands right on the other side of the lake? Yes, there's lots of pasture. And John describes it in his gospel as being a pasture area. So that's where they are. But it is the idea still of trying to, to get away. He's trying to get away for a time for himself uh, and, uh, uh, and for a time of, of teaching, teaching his guys. Uh, he would also end up again going to Caesarea Philippi, uh, other areas, uh, because of the news of, of John's death. Secondly, and where we want to spend more time here, is he had compassion for the crowd. He sees a large crowd, says he has compassion on them, he heals their sick. It's not what he went for. He went away for a time of rest. I don't know about you, but uh, if you're totally exhausted and you've gone somewhere for a time uh, of, of rest, uh, a little mini vacation, a week in a way, uh, and uh, and now there's there's now more work than you can possibly do in a sense presented uh, to you. Uh, some of us might be a little irritated, upset, grumbling, angry. Even if we did it, we do it with maybe not the best attitude. But again, that's that's the setting here, uh, and it says that uh, he had compassion on them. Mark's gospel adds another little phrase that's important. Mark uh, six thirty four. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So healing the sick and ministering to them, teaching them many things. We came across this word compassion earlier in Matthew's gospel. <clears throat> Remember, we said it's not the word sympathy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a much stronger word from that. And I actually went through some cross-references. And it means that he physically had an internal feeling in his gut. We'd say it was gut-wrenching. That would be a, they're, they're not going to use that phrase, <laughs> but that's more of the idea. Jesus, when he looked upon a crowd, and the last time he, we, uh, we saw him do that, it's because he realized that they were lost. Uh, and in this sense, uh, Mark fills us in like sheep without a, a, a shepherd, lost and lost for all eternity. And when Jesus saw somebody like that, he f literally felt something. It was not sympathy it was uh, and it was much stronger than our own word compassion he physically felt something in his gut because he realized the importance if they if they don't come into the kingdom you know what's what uh, their the outcome is uh, is going to be uh, twice we see him moved with compassion in terms of crowd the hungry hungry multitude here but it's not just with crowds two blind men in Matthew 20 a leper in Mark 1 
Again, stirred with compassion. The widow of Nain, stirred with compassion. It's not for just the multitudes or the big crowds or the 5,000 to do a miracle. It's for individuals as, uh, as well. Uh, again, uh, we can be thankful that we have a, a compassionate God. It's why we're not consumed. Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3.22 says that it is because of his, his great love that we're not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Paul says this in terms of uh, God the Father in 2 Corinthians 1.3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And uh, certainly if... Uh, uh, although sometimes the focus maybe is on the multiplying the loaves and the fishes, which again, it's a tremendous miracle that the why he does it is more important is because Jesus Christ uh, and reflecting the character of God, the father, the God that we serve is a God of compassion. And he cares greatly about an individual as well as a, a crowd or, or a whole nation. Uh, the third thing there's a conflicted king who's very self-centered, the compassionate king who cares greatly for the crowds as well as the individual. And there's a concerned king in terms of Jesus, and the concern is for, for his disciples. Verse 15 goes on, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the village and villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So certainly he's concerned when his disciples begin to instruct him. <laughs> That's kind of a, that'd make you a little concerned. I mean, if you read that, they're, they're kind of like, you know, calling the shots. All right, Jesus, is what we want you to do here. Uh, we don't really think you realize what the situation is here. And so we're going to kind of help you out. Send them away. You know, so that's uh, that that would be uh, uh, certainly bring concern to the, the heart of Jesus. That's that's their good counsel because they considered the time, which was evening. They considered the place, which was desolate. And they came to the conclusion that nothing could be done to solve the problem. And again, uh, maybe we've said at times like them, hey, I'd like to do something for the Lord. But I know one thing for sure. This ain't the right place or the right time. I can tell you that right now. And that, that's, that's what they're saying here. Uh, secondly, he's concerned, so he shows his disciples their limited resources as he tells them to feed the crowd. And they respond, well, we've only got five loaves and two fish. John's gospel, again, gives us a little more insight. John 5, 9, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, uh, where shall we buy some bread for these people to eat? He, he asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he's going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Sarcasm there. Uh, verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? You know, sometimes we get the... Andrew, bringing people to Jesus, you know, tremendous man. Operation Andrew, <laughs> it doesn't look too good right here. Uh, very sarcastic. Uh, again, same reason, uh, wrong place, wrong time, can't happen, not going to happen. And, uh, and Jesus is just already had in mind what he's going to do. And he's saying, what do you think you, we ought to do? And you guys feed them and, uh, uh, and so forth. And he is like just plying them with a couple of questions to, to show them. Uh, their own limited resources. He already, he already knew what he was going to do. Uh, this is all about training uh, these these 12 guys. So thirdly, he's concerned that disciples will learn to trust him in every uh, in any situation. Again, 
They probably thought of the verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own five loaves and three fishes, <laughs> but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he'll just multiply this out to everybody. I'm sure they were just kind of recounting that. No, I, and that's one of our, we love that verse. I love that verse. Uh, but uh, applying it and living it out sometimes in every and any situation, that's the point, uh, is often very difficult. And, uh, and there's some, some principles here for us, I think, that are important. Uh, one is that Jesus wants his disciples, including us, to learn to trust him and know that he can work in any and every situation. And the problem here is a lack of faith. These guys had been with Jesus. These guys had seen the miracles. Jesus had never failed to heal anyone. Uh, anything he did, set out to do, I mean, he did it. Uh, so, you know, it, again, we could, we could look at these guys and say, man, I wish they would get with it. Come on, you're with Jesus, the Son of God. He'll speak in into existence. I mean, just trust him, we could say to them. But uh, again, we find our own selves on a different kind of mountain somewhere, and it's the wrong place, and it's the wrong time, and the Lord is, maybe wants to use us to minister to somebody, and we're going, not now, not here, not these, you got to be kidding me, and uh, just send them away, send this opportunity away. It's not that they don't want to serve, they want to serve, this is just not, just not the right time, it's not the right place, it's not the right occasion, uh, it's not, they, they don't have the right gifting, none of these guys had a catering business, they're fishermen. You know, I've only got so many things I can do. I want to do what I can for the Lord. But, you know, I've only got, you know, I'm only gifted. And, and, uh, and, and we find ourselves, and it's really always an issue of, uh, of a lack of faith. The disciples knew he could do the miracles. Uh, they just, just felt like it was the wrong place, wrong time. Human reasoning says it's not the right place. Uh, but again, often faith has nothing to do with human reasoning. I... Uh, Several years ago, we've got the How to Walk conference coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then uh, on the Saturday, and there's uh, Bill, Pastor Bill and Calvary Chapel, Honolulu, at Como Mai, trying to figure out their, their name now. And uh, they uh, are going to bring several guys over uh, from the mainland for that. And then they will stay and do a, a pastor's conference uh, the following Monday and Tuesday and Wednesdays, and then some outreaches in the evening. That all originated out of just a, a time of prayer and everything with a bunch of guys with Bill. Uh, and the first one was called How to Walk in 84. I'm going to date myself here a little bit. And really, uh, uh, Bill just wanted, he just thought as he's teaching us and discipling us and meeting together with us on Saturday mornings, a handful of guys. Uh, he had, you know, kind of uh, grown up in the ministry uh, with these guys. I mean, when he went to what was called a, like kind of like a, a pastoral school that was like six weeks and then send you out because there was just such a tremendous need. Uh, it it might have been longer, but it was like three months at the most or whatever. And Bill went to the mainland and the first guy he met when he pulled up in the, in the parking lot was a guy that said, uh, Hey, man, preach the Lord. You know, it's Raul Reese and he's in the same school. So Bill grew up with all of those guys. Uh, 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 back when. So he, he wanted us to be able to have the benefit of sitting under their teaching. We'd listen to some of them were on the radio. We didn't own K-Light at the time. Some of them were on uh, another station here locally, but uh, he wanted us to sit down and have this time with them. That's what originated though. So he says, well, if we're going to bring them over and do that, let's do this one day conference and we'll do this and we'll do that. And uh, now what the, the point of my story in all this is that we didn't have any money. We didn't have a budget for it, but the bill just, well, let's just trust the Lord. Maybe it's not the right place. It's not the right time. The church wasn't very big. We didn't have a facility. We were meeting at schools in the Kapilani Park and wherever we could meet. It wasn't the right time or the right place, but they said, let's just see what the Lord will do. So with no money, we rented, the, we reserved the Sheraton Ballroom. No, we had it at the Alamoana American, uh, the Alamoana Hotel, Americana Hotel, and then we uh, Alamoana Shopping Center used to have a little uh, meeting room banquet facility. We ran the pastors' conference and how to walk simultaneously, and the guys walked back and forth. Uh, didn't have any money to bring all the guys over and pay for their airfare. Uh, we just we just did it. We did it all without any money, and uh, and just kind of prayed it through. Uh, and in the end, we we took an offering. We sold tapes. And we had about $10 left, no more than 15 The whole thing was totally 
covered. It would have been really easy to say, and that thing is still going, uh, you know, probably, you know, hundreds, if, if not, you know, you know, in the thousands have come to faith in Christ because it's been a few years with all these outreaches every every evening during that conference and so forth. It would have been really easy to say that it wasn't the right place and it wasn't the right time. <laughs> Besides, we don't have any money. Uh, but faith said, yeah, but let's just see what the Lord will do. And uh, and that's that's a contrast with uh, with these guys uh, here. So it's such an important lesson. Uh, the second thing is, Jesus wants his disciples to learn to trust him and know that they are distributors and not suppliers. Jesus gives to the disciples the bread and the loaves, and then they, they give it to, to others. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, that which I've received from the Lord, I give also unto you. Uh, you know, we're, we're not <laughs> the suppliers. We're only the distributors. As I have received God's compassion, I can be compassionate towards others. As I've received God's grace, I can share that grace with others. If I've received his forgiveness, I can be forgiving towards others. As God has shown me mercy, I can show mercy to others. We're just the distributors of what God has given us. The apostles, in a, in a sense, only participated in the miracle, right? They didn't really do the miracle. But, they, but because they were there and because they were obedient to what Jesus asked them to do, they were able then to uh, be part of the whole thing. I often make reference to uh, the uh, Jesus turning the water and the wine. And I just think what's cool about that is that you've got the servants who uh, Mary says, do whatever he says to do. And he says, you know, go. the pots are, were huge. They went and, and uh, filled them up with water to the brim and then they, they bring them in. Uh, and then, you know, of course, they take the cup and they take it to the, you know, the host of the wedding. And he tastes it and says, wow, you saved the, uh, the best wine for last. Uh, but the servants knew. I mean, he didn't know it was a miracle, right? I mean, he just, this is really great. Thank you. But the, the guys that knew or knew immediately were the ones that were part of the process. Uh, they're the ones that carried it in. They immediately knew that it was a miracle. And that got to be part of the, the whole thing. Um, which uh, leads us to number three. Jesus wants his disciples to learn to trust him and know that when you serve the Lord, you benefit directly from the work. Notice there were 12 basket full left over. How many disciples are there? Because <laughs> you, know, you have to wonder, Peter and those guys, they're, they're, uh, I mean, as they're, as they're you know, distributing all the food, you, you think maybe in their mind they're going, I wonder if there's going to be any left over by the time this is all done. We haven't eaten either here yet. You know, I mean, they, these guys didn't always have the best attitude where they're doing this kind of kind of stuff. And we see uh, Peter uh, spitting out his toenails on more than one occasion. And uh, uh, they're as carnal as anybody else at this point. They're learning. They're growing through the process and everything. But uh, in the end, what happens? They, they get a basket full. And I think there's a, there's a lesson there. When we do serve the Lord and trust Him, that we end up benefiting directly from, uh, from the work. When you teach Sunday school or you teach a Bible study, you learn more of the Bible. You learn the Bible studies to teach the Bible studies, and you benefit directly from that. Uh, and we could, we could go you know, on and on. When, when you serve the Lord, uh, you may not see it immediately, but in the long run, you'll be able to look back and say, Wow, I think I was the one that benefited directly. These guys are getting ready to go to Japan to serve the churches over there, to serve uh, a lot of the kids in the churches and, uh, and so forth and be involved in evangelism. But uh, I'd be willing to bet that they will benefit directly from having gone on the trip. And that's, that's part of the whole, the whole thing and why we're excited to, to see them go. Again, uh, the other thing that, that happens at the end of this thing is, uh, is very interesting. And John's gospel gives us the, the, more of the details. Uh, the people are so excited because of what's happened that they, they try to make him king by force. And again, there's a lot of drama building here. I mean, he's pretty much done everything the Messiah was supposed to be. A lot of them are thinking maybe he is the Messiah and so forth. You've got the, the Pharisees and now plotting with the Sadducees, now joining with the Herodians who are basically sold out to Rome. These people that would never be together 
Uh, it's like the uh, Democrats and Republicans and the Libertarians all coming together and for one purpose, and, uh, and it's to see uh, Jesus killed. All of that drama is building, but the people here at this miracle, John says, they want to make Jesus king by force. Like, we don't care if you want to do this or not. We're just going to make you be our king, and we want you to throw out the Romans and uh, in this oppression and so forth. Uh, so he, just, he gets his guys out of there. Basically, uh, if, again, he, he gets his 12 guys. He's taught them. They got the lessons. <laughs> get your baskets and get in the boat. You know, we'll look at that next week and sends them off. And then he finally does get away to be able to pray. pray. But yeah, he's not going to be manipulated by this crowd. And he doesn't even want his guys anywhere near it. And he gets them, gets them out of there. And he sends them off. The next day, John's Gospel says he's preaching again or teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, many of the same people. What does he teach on? I'm the bread of life. You're real excited about getting a handout? You still don't really understand the concept. Uh, John 6, uh, 26. Let me read just a couple of verses from there. This is the next day in the synagogue. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On Him, God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they asked Him, What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. People were willing to receive the physical bread and the meal. They were happy for what was at the Master's table, but they really weren't there just to be in the the master's uh, presence. He fed them. They were satisfied, and uh, and that was that was it. And uh, it's not like that didn't happen in the uh, in the Old Testament. Hosea thirteen five, if I can remember, it says that uh, uh, I cared for you in the land of the of the burning heat. I'm paraphrasing there a little bit, but basically he says. Then he kind of breaks from what he did from them, and and uh, and says, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. And, uh, and that's a little bit of, of what's going on here. I mean, they're not forgetting him, but they, they want him and they want to come to him for all the wrong reasons. Uh, Herod's looking to him because uh, he's very concerned and very conflicted. And he now, along with the rulers of Jerusalem, all want his uh, his death. The people are looking to him because they want more more handouts and more meals and more of their physical needs uh, cared for and taken care of. Uh, and he's going to, at this point, pour his life into these 12 guys who are, in a sense, going to, after they receive the Holy Spirit, turn the world upside down with the gospel. Because his kingdom been, has, that's been rejected would now come to individually spiritually as we go out, as they went out, like farmers sowing, uh, sowing seed. But in the process, we need, it, it's all about learning to trust Him. It's all about having faith in Him. It's all about, even though it's not the right place and it's not the right time and it's not the best circumstances and I'm not really gifted in this area and can't you get somebody else and maybe there'll be another opportunity later. <clears throat> it's very easy to say that. And sometimes we miss the, the greatest opportunities that the Lord gives. Now, he doesn't let them out of it. He just shows them, you got really limited resources. You know, it's like Paul, Paul says, uh, he says, uh, we are not competent, you know, in ourselves, nor do we claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. And, uh, and that ought to be uh, our heart. I realize my limited resources. I realize I really can't do much for the Lord. I realize that I really don't have much to offer for the Lord, but I'm willing to, to trust Him and take what was, uh, uh, you know, the hero in this story is a little boy about five or six years old. We know his age approximately because of the Greek text. And, uh, and the other thing that's interesting is what he brings is five barley loaves. And by the way, that's what you fed to animals. People didn't eat barley loaves. Uh, and he had a couple of dried fish or pickled fish. So He's is a really poor kid, and he doesn't have much. But he's, hey, here's what I've got. I don't know what you can do with it. Do you think that kid maybe was a little more excited than everybody else? Because he knew. 
he knew where all that came from. He was he was right there. And uh, you know that that's the Lord's not looking for <laughs> riches, you know, and and talents and what we have to offer. Again, it's not ability; it's availability with humility. It's not just a availability; it's with humility. And uh, and we see it in a little kid here, and how thrilled he must have been to be used by the Lord. So the contrast between a very um, wicked king versus a very compassionate king. Matthew's trying to show us, and again, trying to the concern for for these guys, which I think, if we're honest, we could all we can all relate to them more than we can the the little kid. Uh, but I think we need to be more like the little boy and just say, well. <laughs> Not much, but uh, whatever you can do, Lord, it's I'm I'm good with it. Whatever the outcome, He didn't know what the outcome would be, but it's it's yours. It's a it's a surrendered life that uh, He's used by the Lord. These guys are still learning it, and we are too as well. Spring, Father, we do rejoice that uh, You're compassionate for us. Uh, that Your compassions uh, are new every morning. That they never fail and. Lord, we uh, just pray that you'd continue to teach us, but again, not that we would certainly uh, gain more information or head knowledge or principles of, of how you'd have us live or do ministry or serve others, but Lord, these would be things that you could help us take and uh, apply. Maybe this afternoon, maybe uh, this week, there would be an opportunity that I might have a tendency to where I could be a witness for the Lord or do something for the Lord. And my tendency might be to, <laughs> not now, not this place, but I might go ahead and step out and, and trust you in a, in a way that I haven't uh, before. That I might be reminded of this little boy that just gave what he had, and it totally was not very much. It was, uh, it was an admission of his own, his own poverty. Uh, but in doing it, uh, uh, his resources became a, a tremendous miracle and a, a testimony to the compassion and the greatness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, so we, we just pray you'd work in your spirit uh, uh, in our lives today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel like you're just walking down the street, don't you? Maybe you're walking ahead of the Lord. Huh? And we gotta learn to wait. It goes like this. I will wait for you. Watch and wait for you. I will wait for you. Watch and wait for you. Here's the song. I will wait for you. Keep my eyes on you. Stand back and let you do what you do. Not fall or faint or lose my faith. I'm gonna watch and wait for you. I'm gonna watch and wait for you. There are so many other reasons, so many other ways. Sometimes it's hard to hold up under the heat of the day. But you've given me a vision. I've been dreaming this dream. I'm gonna keep my faith in you I'm gonna watch and wait for you cause it's true so true even the mighty can break and fall apart it's true so true even the vigilant can fall asleep in the dark it's true so true that pride can find a place in the it all back to you. I'll give it all back to you. You've given so much to me. Every treasure I see, every dream I can see, every promise I hold on to, everything I believe. I'm gonna keep my faith in you. I'm gonna watch and wait for you. Cause it's true, so true. Even the mighty can't 
helps so for to get a little feedback here. I mean, we get feedback from our instruments sometimes, but it's you got the good kind of feedback. Yeah. Sorry, destruction happened. times you've often wondered why is there so many guitars up there and um, that's because guitars are normally untrustworthy just when you're in the heart of a song you see a string go boink and it's like oh no Shall not 
be afraid of my stronghold, my Savior, I shall not be moved. Only in God is my soul. You are 